culture in case you don't know me and pleased to welcome you today to this workshop and to the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh people um, who have taken such excellent care of our lands, our water and our air that we breathe for thousands of years and uh, you know we always like to uh, try to do whatever we can, come on in, at the Alliance to encourage everybody to make some kind of a personal commitment to get involved in the reconciliation process, whether it's uh, an act of kindness <coughs> or you know, being part of a bigger uh, demonstration up on Burnaby Mountain, or uh, whatever that looks like to you. you know. So we just, uh, it's, it's important uh, to us, and uh, we hope that it's important to you too. Um, I'm not going to be able to stay for the session, unfortunately, because I've had a, 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 have a family uh, emergency sort of thing. Um, but I want to welcome you, and I want to introduce to you today our facilitators um, from Grant Advance. This is David Prasard here. Oh, David Prasard there, and Guy Pearson. Here, I got them all mixed up. And they come from Grant Advance, which is a, a <coughs> way to raise uh, money uh, through the private sector. And uh, the alliance has taken, um, ha, ha, it is, is uh, have a license for grant advance, and we think it's a really terrific uh, opportunity for the sector. So we wanted to share that with you guys so that you can learn more about it and generally about foundation fundraising in general. So have a wonderful time, and I'll turn it over to uh, David and Matt. Thank you. Um, my name is Guy McPherson. Um, I am the um, co-founder, CEO for Grant Advance, and I'll be introducing the other uh, members here. Since this is an arts organization, we've given ourselves stage names. So, um, stand up, Samuel. This is Abbott, and we're the two Costellos. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's very obvious. Um, uh, so just really quickly, my background um, has been primarily as an executive director, um, I was telling Heather, um, in, in a past life, mostly uh, in the faith-based sector, um, a little bit of third world um, development, etc. cetera. Um, but in the last decade, I focused mostly on fund development and technology. Um, David, my colleague, um, he's gonna be giving you and providing you with a, an introduction in just a moment. Um, David has, um, I, he, he's, his entire life has been philanthropy, he's been involved in funding venues of all sorts, and I, um, he breaks my brain with his dreams and vision, he thinks big, he thinks outside of the box, and he knows and believes that nonprofits change the world. So uh, you're going to get a little bit of that from him. And um, Samuel is our uh, youngest in our company, but he's been with us for two years. We recruited him out of Brock University in a business management program. He's in our mentor, our leadership mentor program now, and he heads up our entire support services department and does an absolutely fantastic job. And as you hear from him later, you'll know why we brought this firecracker on our team. Um, I'm gonna turn this over now uh, to David to just make some introductory um, comments and uh, hopefully inspire you a bit. And then I'll come back and we'll go over um, the information that we prepared for you for today. Hello to everybody. I've been really relishing this day um, and knowing that uh, the arts leaders will be gathering in a single place. Um, and I wanted to tell you that uh, of my 30 years of of, of fundraising all the way from a Boy Scout to the leading organizations such as the United Way, um, Rick Hansen Foundation, uh, children's literacy programs. I've been a food bank manager. I've been a youth at risk counselor for First Nations organizations. I've, 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 had, I've had every bake sale and banquet known to man. <laughs> and, um, and I'm very much events oriented in my time. And uh, I slowly but surely began to evolve a consciousness and it, it kind of evolved with, with the times and I recall um, my first essence of fundraising would be to open up, for instance, a Yellow Pages and look at a business number and pick up the phone and call a business and ask for a donation. And uh, thinking how uh, technology and, and the internet and social media has now revolutionized the industry um, it, is a, it is an amazing time for all of the practitioners of fundraising to take hold of this immense opportunity. 
So I, am, I, I will tell you, having groveled on the front lines for so many years and now being a huge proponent of using any information source, any information piece, and the one thing I will instill about, um, about the ask, in essence, is that all of you are very passionate about your organizations. You love your organizations, and you probably, most of you, live and breathe your organizations. Don't fear uh, asking anyone for help or funding. There is no reason to fear the ask. Uh, and, and, that is, and, and when you speak from the heart, and you come from a position of yourself and the oneness with your organization, that always ends up opening amazing doors, and it always has for me. I uh, remember leading, uh, well, uh, does anybody know Raymond Chow, the famous Raymond Chow, the artist? Um, Raymond Chow, uh, yeah, he's now in Halifax now, and I'll tell you about a little anecdotal fundraising event that I led. I, I would go out and I would, uh, my expertise was to combine nonprofits and have nonprofits partner for events to collaborate, basically collective impact. And we set up an event uh, a number of years ago where we booked the most glamorous room at the Granville Island Hotel, and everyone knows where that is, a beautiful venue, Granville Island Hotel. And uh, Raymond was uh, offering up his art for a, 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 a phenomenal art auction at the time, and we had the the Red Cross uh, with their email list, and we were blitzing everyone to come and fill the room. We ordered um, all of the beautiful high-end hors d'oeuvres and chocolate fondue and everything under the sun. And we were sitting in this beautiful room waiting for people to arrive. The only issue was is that on that day, the Vancouver Canucks and the Boston Bruins were playing game seven of the Stanley Cup final. Guess what? We sat there and we had an empty room. It was actually, it was actually empty. So we were lucky to have a, a wine convention uh, <laughs> next door. They were, there was a wine convention uh, being held at the hotel, so we invited everyone in for free. And ultimately, at the very 11th hour of that event, we had a young, we had a, a it was a, a wonderful uh, uh, elderly Asian lady came in and purchased a $15,000 painting. And that ended up paying, just paying for the event. It took us six, six to nine months to put on the event. But the lesson learned, ultimately, and I think we've all been through the anxiety of the events. When we, um, you know, in our forays of fundraising as, as nonprofits, make sure we always have the, the pillars of our support. Um, there are many pillars of fundraising support with the social media, crowdfunding, memberships, uh, you, uh, you, you have your events, you have, um, um, excuse me, I'm losing my train of thought. The uh, uh, seven pillars, uh, and uh, the seven pillars uh, focus on um, making sure you have all of the tenants for fundraising uh, in place, and we'll be able to send you uh, some information on, on what we consider and recommend as all of those uh, focal points for successful and sustainable fundraising. So I am uh, now being introduced to, uh, and, and very proudly representing Grand Events. Guy and I have been colleagues for a number of years and um, I am such a huge proponent of, of the information provided through the analytics. It is all about the data analytics, and if you think about it, it's really, in essence, the DNA. It's the DNA of information. So as you're going in your Sherlock Holmesian ways, and you're doing your detective work to under potential leads and, and, and uh, funding sources, it's all about having the patience, the persistence, and the insight and understanding and analyzing the behaviors of foundations. And so our, our presentation today is going to be uh, uh, you know, underscoring um, how our resource is going to support your efforts in that regard and make you all better organizations. So without further ado, I'll introduce <coughs> my, my uh, partner guy. Thanks. Um, thanks, David. Um, one of the things about David, he brings this to the table every time we meet and talk or to anybody in our, he, um, he leads with love. And that may sound a little corny, uh, but it's not. And, and, and really, nonprofits are really all about that, no matter how you want to shape that. Um, nobody gets into nonprofit business in order to uh, get rich or to have an easy job. You're all overworked and you're all underpaid, right? So this is, you do this because you're passionate. And if you always remember to lead from that position, um, it doesn't matter what you do, you're going to be successful. At the end of the day, you're touching people and you're changing them, and you're changing the world that you live in. Um, I meant to thank Brenda before she left. Um, for It's been wonderful to meet her. She's a tremendous advocate for um, her um, constituents, 
uh, not only an advocate, she's a pretty good negotiator, <laughs> so as you probably already know. And I wanted to congratulate some of you may be here, uh, some of you may be here by uh, streaming, uh, but those of you who won, we I don't know if you're aware, but there were 10 free memberships that were given out um, to Grant Advance, and we're very excited about that and looking forward to working with those lucky recipients. So yay, yeah, 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 that's great. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to that. Um, so what I wanted to do is, um, the workshop today, e even though we're going to be using Grant Advanced technology, um, it's, it's intended to be primarily educational. Having said that, I still want to give you a brief introduction to the resource, um, what it is and how it evolved. Um, so again, my background has been in nonprofit management, um, in fundamental development and technology. Um, early in my career, and many of you I think might be able to relate to this, but early in my career I was this young buck sitting behind a desk and I knew there were tons of resources available. I knew there were lots of grants that were out there, but I had absolutely no idea how to find them. If I did find them, I had absolutely no idea to apply for them. And if I did know that, I had absolutely no time to do it <laughs> and no one to do it for me. Right? So about five years ago, I sort of put myself behind the desk of that young buck and I realized, you know what, I've gained all this knowledge over the last 30 years. What is it that he would want to have known, what would he have needed to know in order to be able to successfully apply for funding? So the dream and vision was to create something that would demystify the whole grant funding process, make it simple and easy for anyone, regardless of their size or experience. So that's what we set out to try and achieve, and I'm, and I'm not saying that exclusively to promote our system, although I think it's awesome. I'm saying that because I want each of you that are here today or listening um, online to, um, to realize and know that none of what we talk about today is beyond your reach. This is available to anyone. Um, it's, um, it might not be the funding strategy for you right now, um, but I believe it is a funding strategy for any uh, specifically federally registered charity for sure, and, and possibly provincial nonprofits, but certainly if you're a federally registered charity, it's something that you really should um, think about because most executive directors, their least favorite thing, my least favorite thing, was fundraising, right? But it's probably the most important thing that's on their plate. If there's no, you know, I just was watching Cabaret last night. <laughs> that money makes the world go round, the world go round, the world go round. Without it, you can't do and you can't achieve the dreams that you have. So we're here today to talk about another source, one of the seven pillars, and that is specifically foundation funding for your organization. Um, here's some interesting facts. Uh, you've been seeing them up here, and I don't know if you knew this before, but as these things get revealed to me, I realize this is not something I can afford to ignore. Um, there are 170,000 nonprofits in Canada employing over 2 million people. That's huge. By GDP, the nonprofit sector in Canada is larger than, get this, the oil and gas industry. Did you have any idea that you were part of that? Larger than the oil and gas industry, we are all isolated in our small little circles and forget to realize we're part of a massive society changing movement, really. And another really great thing for us Canadians, we pat ourselves on the back, is that per capita, the nonprofit sector in Canada is the second largest in the world. We're socially responsible and aware. Isn't that awesome, right? Now we get down to the brass tacks. Foundations in Canada award every year $5 billion, and almost all of that goes to federally registered charities. They, there are civic organizations, et cetera. But that's $5 billion, and in terms of assets, as of 2015, the total assets held by all foundations in Canada was $70 billion. Huge. Not only that, by law, they are required, in most cases, there's some exceptions to this, but I'll tell you why that doesn't matter. Um, by law, foundations must give 3.5% of that away every year in grants. 
But the truth is that they give closer to 7%. So the question is, is this a area that any of you that are involved in the nonprofit world can really afford to ignore? And I, I don't really think that we can. Um, so our objection, objections, <laughs> objections, our objectives today are to I, show you how to identify potential funders for your organization, help you with a strategy, um, looking at what is very critical in this whole process, and that is building meaningful relationships, and then follow up, and then a, a future strategy for success. Um, my dad, um, one of his favorite sayings, he would say, son, I taught you everything I know and you still don't know nothing. <laughs> So I'm just hoping that at the end of today, that's not how any of you walk away. So at any rate, so let's, let's start with what I think is probably the most important thing, is identifying potential funders. So what are the best identifiers for you? What you have to remember right off the bat is this is not ever about you. It's always about the foundation. It's always about you matching their interests and their mandate and their activities. That's what you have to do. So we, there have to be um, identifiers that you need to see and understand uh, the value of. Think of this as a, um, this as a dating app, uh, Match.com for foundations. What you're looking for is the person or the organization I'm approaching um, do we share the same interests, right? Um, do we live in the same, or operate in this case, in the same area? And is this fellow likely to take me to the keg or McDonald's, right? Uh, grant size, right? And, and whether or not that's important to you. So you're, you're, trying to, um, you're trying to find and identify foundations that will be good matches for you. Um, so something that would sound very obvious um, is that you want to identify foundations that are similar to you in terms of their mandate. And the first place to start is foundations that have funded you in the past. Now, that may sound elementary, but it is shocking to us <laughs> how many times we're working with a client and they don't even know that there was a specific foundation that funded them five years ago. Oh my gosh, I, that kind of lost information, we, you have to re-engage and you have to nurture and you have to make sure, whether it's a foundation or anyone else that has been funding you in the past, you need to know who those, who those organizations are. Uh, and that is, of course, important for a number of reasons, re-engaging, but if you do have analytics and you do have uh, data on foundations, you can also leverage that information to find out whether or not you've been leaving money on the table. You might be so happy with the foundations that they're giving you $5,000 every year, only to find out they're giving everybody else $25,000, <laughs> right? So you need to re-engage, you need to leverage based on new information that you gained, and you need to work the relationships. Like who are the directors serving on the board now? We'll talk more about that as we move forward. But all of these past relationships have tremendous opportunities for you. Now, let's say you're an organization that has never had a past relationship, or you don't have that many, or you want a lot more, <laughs> right? And that's what we really want, is to continue to grow this relational uh, base. So what we want to be looking for are similar organizations. For example, if you were the executive director of the SPCA in Vancouver, do you not think it would be very important for you to know which foundations fund the Humane Society? Does that make sense to you? Sure. Or even Bob's dog shelter, right? Find out every organization that's animal activist and find out who is funding them because those organizations have already demonstrated an interest in your mandate. So we'll talk about that a little bit more later on as well. Um, so again, organizations that have funded you in the past or are similar to you, you want to identify those foundations. The other thing you want to identify are family foundations in your region. Does anybody here have any idea how many family foundations are in BC? How many do you think there would be? Take a guess. 104. So you're halfway. <laughs> 
Here's an interesting thing about family foundations. Almost none of them have a website. <laughs> Almost none of them have a website. Almost all of them fund equally in every category or sector. It means they fund health, they fund arts, they fund religion, they fund education, they fund social and human services, almost equally in every area. And the other thing is, is that they almost always fund primarily their own province, and generally a fairly wide geographical distribution. It's kind of exciting, isn't it? So it would be good to know and identify family foundations in BC. Um, another, um, another identifier we want to look for are new foundations that have been recently registered in Canada. Why would we want to know new foundations that were registered in 2016, or 17, or 15, or 13? The, <laughs> exactly. They, almost none of them have websites. They have not got established uh, funding partnerships yet, right? They are not approached, to exactly this issue, there's very little competition because most people aren't approaching them. Now, a typical way to build a relationship with an established foundation is to send out a letter of inquiry. But in the case of new foundations, we know very little about them. There's very little data actually until after two or three years that's reported to the CRA that will give us enough to analyze to give you a good handle on who they are. We might know nothing other than their name and their address. But our, um, our suggestion to you is that you don't send them a request, you send them a letter welcoming them to the philanthropic community in British Columbia and telling them how excited you are about their commitment and saying if at some point you think that there would be any partnership between us and we could make a difference together, please get in touch. Right? You are out at the head of the crowd. So this is also a really good and, and terrific uh, identifier for organizations that want to get funding from foundations. Foundations, another identifier, are foundations with whom you have a key relationship. This is going to be primarily directors. So you want to know who are the directors serving on the board right now, and you want to, number one, find out, um, do we know any of those people? You want to print out that list, you want to give it to your board members, you want to give it to your staff, you want to give it to friends of your organization and say, does anybody golf with this guy? <laughs> we all know that the best advertising in the world is word of mouth. So if you can begin your campaign for funding from a foundation, from somebody who is a key decision maker or an influencer in that foundation, you are way ahead of the crowd. So you want to identify, you identify them by putting in the name and searching for the name of somebody who is high net worth in your community or high profile in your community, right? Or you simply print out a list of every director that <coughs> serves on any board in the city of Prince George and you distribute that. Sam, you had an excellent example of a client who just received a grant. Yeah, so what they actually did is they went around and they asked all of their members where they were from, and they took that list and they showed it to the members and they received $90,000. Someone knew someone from their home city and the connection fell through and they got 90000 just from a connection like that. So, pretty important identifier. Agreed? So, you never know. Um, you never know who might be out there who's prepared to be an advocate for your cause. Um, and then, of course, if you have a rating um, a potential, uh, if you have a third-party service um, like this or another, um, if you can find out and identify foundations that you can identify because they give most of their money and most of their grants to a specific sector, in your case, the arts. Of course, if that makes sense. Um, <laughs> so, what we want to do is now talk about organizing these potential funder lists. We're, gonna, we're going to, in a moment, create a number of lists and we're going to start populating them with arts funders in BC and we'll start taking a look at that kind of thing. But you want to organize your funder list and you do this um, by um, getting information on the foundations. So let's talk about information, information on foundations. 
How many of you are currently actively or have been involved in applying to foundations for funding? Anybody here? Okay, so where do you get your information on a foundation? Website. Personal contact. Personal contact. Website. Website. Okay. Social media now. Social media. The CRA um, has a lot of information. It's like uh, 100 monkeys on 100 computers for 100 years. It's a lot of work uh, to extract the data, but it's there. Um, so um, here's what I want to talk to you about. Unfortunately, in Canada, data on foundations has some significant limitations. If you were in the United States, for example, foundations must report to the US government every year um, every grant they award, just like they do here, like in Canada, Canada, Canadian, Canadian um, foundations must report every grant that they award, how much they gave, who they gave it to, and when they gave it. In the U.S., there's one more incredibly significant piece of data that must be reported, and that is what that grant was for. I wish. Oh, I wish. But we don't have that data. Um, and the only way you're going to get that data is if you get it off of their website. But guess what? Only about 30% of all foundations in Canada have a website. Shocking, right? It might be a little bit more, it might be a little less, but actually I would say it's even more because many of those websites are <laughs> Sorry, they don't have hardly anything on it. Uh, there's, and it, it, it takes you nowhere. They have a website. Nothing's there. So you can safely say that 70% 70, uh, 70 of the foundations, you're not going to get any further information on their website. You probably won't on news. You might Google a director's name, which is a good idea we'll talk about later. But there is a limitation. There is a, a dearth of information in Canada. What they, what, in Canada, when a foundation reports, there are three other fields that they have the option of filling in. Their new programs, their ongoing programs, and their primary giving interests. But guess what? They don't have to do it. And if you're looking at any profile pages, which we'll be looking at in a moment, you'll see that sometimes most of them don't put in anything. And the ones that do put in stuff, it's not that detailed. So what we do and what we recommend, actually, it, uh, Samuel, as an example, um, go to the Heathcliff Foundation. Do a search by name. Go to the Heathcliff Foundation. H-E-A-T-H-C-L-I-F-F. -F. Oh, so one word, one word. So, um, and just highlight here, they're not a huge foundation, but they're not bad. They have $2.3 mil $2 million in assets, but guess what they don't have? What I was talking about before, down below, they have no website, right? And go down to their programs, new programs, nothing. Ongoing programs, pretty mm, generic and primary giving interest. Good for you guys, festivals, performing groups, musical ensembles, etc. But that's all the data that you're generally gonna be able to find on this foundation. That's why we um, train and teach and encourage um, our clients to do what we call intuitive matching. So um, Sam, if you can go down to the donation history. What they must do, what foundations must do is report all of their grants. So we have um, um, all the grant information, every grant, every foundation, all about 11,000 foundations in Canada, every grant that they've ever awarded since 2008, if they've been in existence that long. And you're able to come in here, and th this is actually a fun fishing trip. Um, where you want to go in here and you want to look at this giving history and like in, in fact here for as an example with the Heathcliff Foundation if we um, if we if we go down and I think it's under uh, order it by amount Samuel um, largest to smallest I think we're already there our largest to smallest and I think you'll see Vancouver Symphony Vancouver Symphony Vancouver Symphony Vancouver Symphony and there are multiple grants of thirty five thousand dollars in succeeding years intuitively we can tell ourselves that this this foundation is willing to fund either we don't know it but we can intuit that maybe this is operational funding right because it's the same amount for a number of years does that make sense 
or if nothing else, they were willing to come on board on a long-term project. So, and, and it's about the only way you're going to be able to identify foundations and try and get an idea of what you should be applying for, what you could apply for, what's likely to be funded. You can do the same thing. Um, go to um, <clears throat> do a, um, a giving history search. Do Art BC uh, Vancouver over a hundred thousand in this foundation? No, no, a, a giving history search. So we're going to look any organizations with the word art in British Columbia with grants over a hundred thousand. Um, and yeah, no, no, um, do search. And I think if you go up here, these are grants, and you can see these are the foundations. We can eliminate that and make a name to show up what he wants, but we want to see all the grants. These are all the grants that have ever been awarded, and it starts with 21 million. And you can see the Art Museum, Vancouver Art Gallery, a number of other ones. These are large grants. It tells me that this foundation is probably a candidate for capital campaigns. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So again, because of the dearth of information, you, you have to take this, in, this intuitive approach. But we, we show and teach you how to do that. Um, <coughs> the, um, the other thing that we do is we, um, we, we recommend, because of this reality in Canada, we recommend that you create and save favorite lists of foundations and give it names that are meaningful. Like you could go um, operating grant foundations, and in that case, or, or foundations that fund operating, or foundations that fund capital. In that case, the parameters that you would be using would be which, these are all foundations. I know that everyone in an operating list are foundations that have funded organizations over multiple years for the same amount. Does that make sense? Um, so you can create as many as you want, be as sp and, and you want, it, you want the, the lists to trigger something in your mind to know why it's there. So for example, you might just have one which is your favorites list, and this would probably be for either a very, very narrow uh, uh, campaign, uh, these are your friends, and you want to include them in almost anything, but you'd probably include them in a very broad one as well. You want to include one that um, are your previous funders. So you'd have previous funders, and everybody in that list, you know they have given you money in the past, right? Um, another favorite list that we would be looking at um, would be, um, actually, Samuel, probably go to campaign manager, go to the favorites list, and it's, you have those sort of pocketed. They would just show you what we're talking about. Um, so if you go to a favorite funders list, and we open that up, and we click on there, uh, we have um, previous funders, family foundations, you might want to put one in for specific organizations. For example, if you were an organization that worked with youth, you would probably want to have a, uh, a list, a favorites list called Boys and Girls uh, Club Funders. Big Brothers, Big Sisters Funders. Boy Scouts Funders. Girl Guide Funders. It doesn't matter if there's three or ten or three hundred in the list, you know why they're in that list. They're in that list because they fund Big Brothers. Is making sense? Okay, so, um, and then you'd want to, so those are really creating specific um, lists of specific organizations and why they funded them. And then of course the Family Foundations list, so BC Family Foundations, uh, a new list, a new foundation list, you might go um, um, new 2017, new 2016, new 2015. And this then becomes a list that you can uh, work from and use when you want to add these organizations to your project. Um, you'd want to create a director's list. Um, Samuel, maybe um, you'll probably be doing it later, but just go to the uh, director's, um, just go to the director's search engine. And just put in uh, Kelowna, BC Kelowna. And there's every single director that serves on a board that's in Kelowna, right? So, and these can be exported to Excel, and you can pass that list around and find out if anybody knows them, and you can leverage those relationships, right? So, really, really helpful stuff. So, you definitely want that. And a ratings list, and I think you're going to be showing that later, aren't you? So, I won't have you go to it. 
Um, so you'll also want to do a ratings list. So you would go in, um, you would go uh, category, arts, British Columbia, and um, four and five star rating, which means that found these foundations have given most of their grants and most of their money to arts, okay? So those are the kinds of things that, um, that we recommend. Find your foundations that look like reasonable matches, uh, put them into favorite lists so you can access them later. Samuel's going to demonstrate right now how we do that. He's going to walk us through some search engines, and that's going to be kind of exciting because we're going to start looking at some actual um, foundations that fund arts organizations in BC. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about um, qualifying um, those leads. So Samuel, do you want to take it over? <clears throat> yeah, perfect. So let's start in our campaign manager, and we're just going to work off of project one today, to keep it simple. And I'm going to go over to our search engines right now. And earlier, I talked to a lovely lady. Her name was Ashley, and she's with Vancouver International Film Festival. And she said it was OK if I used her as an example. So Ashley, if you're wanting to find out, I know you said you were a little bit new at the organization. If you're interested in who's funded you in the past, probably the best thing for you to do is type in Vancouver and film. Any organization with the word Vancouver and film in their name, I want to know who funds them. And if I search this, it's actually going to show all of your previous funders. And we might get a result that we don't want. I don't think that it's Vancouver Jewish Film Festival. So I can even come up here and type the word not Jewish. And we can now see every single foundation that's funded you. You've received uh, 82 grants in the past 10 years. And about half a million dollars was given to you in the past 10 years. And these are all of the foundations. And I can sort this several ways. Some of them showed up more than once. I could even click show funders only once, just to see them individually. Uh, and you have 23 foundations. So this would be an amazing starting point for you, Ashley. Now, I would create a favorite list. I'd call it previous funders. And easy as can be, we just select those. And we would drop all of them into our previous funder favorite list, just like that. OK? Now, another great thing for you to do, Ashley, is there's a very big organization called the Toronto International Film, Fe Film Festival. So let's type that in. And if we search this now, we have a lot more foundations showing up. Let's click show funders only once. We have 126 foundations that have given $11.2 million in the past 10 years. So a really great strategy for you to use is let's create a favorite list that we call similar organizations or even Toronto International Film Festival. And this isn't Toronto, so some of these foundations might be restricted, but a lot of them would be national givers, and those would be really strong leads for you. Right? Is there a way to filter who are, who are national givers? Yeah, so what we would do is we'd open each of them up, and it would show a chart of Canada, and we can identify whether or not they do give nationally. Yeah. But you'd have to go through everyone individually. There's not a way that you could then go through this favorites list and say, I only want to see the ones that give internationally. Okay, so that's a great question. When you're looking up a specific organization, it's showing the foundation that gives to them. Another search that we could do, though, if we cleared this, we could specifically look in BC for organizations that have the word theater or playhouse. And now all of these foundations we know for a fact give to BC. Yes, so great question, yeah. So they may not be organizations that, live, that are located in BC, they just give to BC, is that correct? Yes, and a lot of foundations give nationally. So I just did theater and playhouse, I'll just click on a random one. This gave to Vancouver. They might not even be located in Vancouver though, we can open it up. Uh, and in this case they are, but if we scroll down, we'll see a map of Canada. And if I scroll over here, it's going to show me the other provinces they give to. And I notice after BC, the next darkest province is Ontario. That means that they receive the next largest amount. So in this case, they funded a lot of grants to Ontario. Even if you were based in Toronto, this is still a really relevant contact for you. They're not being restrictive of only giving to Vancouver organizations. Now, they mostly give to organizations in BC. But that makes quite a bit of sense, because this is a foundation that has no internet presence they're probably giving to organizations that they're familiar with, right? These directors are local. They really only know organizations in BC. The other organizations in Ontario probably use a system um, to find foundations like this. 
and they've identified that they give outside, so that's very possibly why they've given to other areas. So just because a foundation shows up, or just because a foundation gave to an organization in Toronto, does not mean that they're restricted to that area, right? And of course, we can see a lot of information. This is the Diamond Foundation. We see on average, they give about 50 grants a year. Uh, you know what? They give almost $8 million away every year, but they have $99 million sitting in the foundation of assets. We can see uh, they give quite large. There's their average and their median grant size. We can see all of the contact information, and this is very common for Canadian foundations. Um, look at this, they have $100 million in assets. How many people do you think know to contact them? They have no information on themselves. We have an address that we can send a letter to via snail mail. And if we look down here, there's really nothing that they provide. This doesn't tell us anything. You can read through that. Uh, registered charities, that's so broad. Right, so very, very little competition in this case with the Diamond Foundation. Is Teeter and Playhouse the, the category you created for arts and culture? Is that, because we, I've seen that. Yeah, so Teeter and Playhouse is just an example I use. I could type in anything. Um, the, the search engine that I was using, it's looking off the name of the organization that received. So at one point in the past 10 years, they gave to an organization that had the word theater or playhouse in it. And if we come down to their donation history, we can type in any keyword. So I could do uh, music, or orchestra, or uh, orchestra, symphony. I could do theater, gallery, right? We can use any, or, uh, any name, and we can search this and see what comes up for that. And they've given to 18, 18 grants to organizations that match those keywords. So now we can look through these and see which one of them uh, we think are relevant. And there's a lot of Vancouver representation here. Um, these might be some of you, right? Isn't this great? <laughs> yeah. And I can also sort it by recipient name, so it, it puts it in uh, uh, by, by the name. And there's a lot of ongoing grants. Even if it's only $10,000 a year, imagine what a difference that can make to your organization, right? And they like to get to the arts. Any questions? I'm curious how Grant Finance collects all of this information. Like, how do you, how have you guys built this database? So what we actually do, this comes from the Canadian Revenue Agency. So whenever a foundation gives a grant, uh, they report it to the CRA, and we gather that information. So Guy actually brought up earlier, this is public knowledge. You can go to the CRA's website, but he used an example of 100 monkeys, 100 computers, 100 years. You would have to go through every single grant that was ever given each year. It's so unrealistic, you, you can't really find it on your own. You can try, but it's, it's all taken from the CRA. Yeah, great question. Any other questions? Can you filter... Um to separate out those that give to only registered charities versus That's a really good question. No, we cannot do that. Um, actually, I'll address that for a moment. I, I realized uh, when we looked at the list, um, there were several organizations here that are, are registered as provincial nonprofits. Um, so you're going to have to face your reality on that. Um, and generally, generally, um, foundations will not fund uh, provincially registered nonprofits. The asset test would be does your organization have the ability to issue a tax receipt? That means that you are a federally registered charity. However, that's not the end of the story. Um, foundations do have a little bit of latitude, especially foundations that are within the province of BC. Family foundations you can apply to. You'll see that they do fund, but there are restrictions by the CRA on that, so I want to be clear about it. Generally, your best bet and I believe, and I know, please don't hold me to this, but I do believe Brenda did tell us that, <laughs> uh, let's not say Brenda, let's say this. Your best bet is if you are a provincially registered um, nonprofit, partner with a charity. That charity can apply for the grant with you as the sole beneficiary. So you would, that, that partner organization doesn't want to do a stitch of work for you, I'm sure. So you'd have to do the research, you'd have to write the grant, you'd have to get everything ready, you'd have to get it prepared, and you submit it to them, and they can submit it to a foundation on your behalf. Okay? Mm -hmm. So find a partner. Better yet, get federally registered. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, we did that. Uh, we 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 have we're federally registered, so we partnered with the group that didn't have their number, and then we charged a five percent admin fee oh. on the grants and the yeah. donations that they. Awesome. Required. So it made our bottom line look better, and then all the money went to them. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's great. Everyone take his name and number. Not to have the same charitable. you do that, then do you also list the partner as the sole? Like you list them, you're like, this is the funding will go towards the partner, or like. How do you mean in the grant? Yeah. Well, the grant would be a, a project description for what the, that group wants to do, and it's being. I think we call it a co-presentation or co-production with okay. our organization and theirs. Mm -hmm. But really, we're just kind of. Yeah. Don't tell them Revenue Canada. I think it's all on the up and up. Yeah, of course it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> Absolutely it is. You're a conduit, and this is all about synergy and partnership, yeah. and it, it's beautiful, actually, when it happens. Yeah. Yeah. As long as your charitable purposes are the same. Yeah. yeah. Right? So it's right. an activity you could be doing. Yes. yes. That's true. Well, actually, I recently found a foundation that literally says, like, if you're not a, if you're not a charity, then, like, we'll help you guide you through the process, but just, like, please put forward the name of the charity. So okay. You know, Like I said, it's not a closed door for provincial nonprofits, but I'm just saying that um, you're at, at, you're on a whole different playing field if you're a federally registered charity. Yeah, well, there's a reason why these people formed foundations. It's partly to get the tax deductions from their immense wealth. <laughs> so they need your charity number. Yes. I mean, that's yeah. crass, but I think that's part yeah. of it, right? Yes, of course, of course. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, another well, question? So yeah. th these are most, these are primarily uh, private foundations, I assume. Uh, like, some, like, compared to something like Vancouver Foundation or Canada Council, which are the federal government agency, I mean, if you're looking for sources of funding for the visual arts or some say, uh, those other, those other aren't really foundations, I guess, but, well, the Vancouver Foundation is, but, uh, so it would just be another one of the foundations listed in here. Funding, um, it, with the CRA, organizations, charitable organizations are registered three ways. And we want to spend a lot of time on here at this because we want, to, we want to move through the rest of the information here. But it's important to know that when you become federally registered, you will have to register as a public foundation, a private foundation, or a charitable trust. Oh. Public foundations and private foundations, well, pu public foundations must give grants. Private foundations, a little bit more of a leeway there. Charitable trusts don't have to give grants ever, but oftentimes they do. Um, and Sam, because it's not in our presentation, why don't we just quickly jump to uh, uh, charitable trusts yeah, um, on the name search. Can you go to the yeah. name search? Sorry for interrupting your flow here. Uh, but go to the name, no, name search and go, again, go Kelowna. Um, and we would recommend here because um, this would show up, a, a charitable trust that has never given a grant will never come into a, a return and they're not even in our system. We don't have, you can't look them up. They're not there unless they've given grants. Yes. But they might only give grants once or twice every three or four years. Well, what a waste of time because you get a huge list. So go put um, uh, awards grants, average grants per year. Let's go eight. And this would give you a list of all of the, found, all of the charitable trusts in Kelowna that have given at least eight grants a year or more. Um, and in that case, you'll, you'll notice this will almost always be the case. They're heavily faith-based uh, oriented. But um, it, um, if you're looking for it, um, please don't be discouraged by it. It's not going to be your first go-to. This is, this is sort of advanced. Um, but what you would look for there are organizations that give at least eight or 12 grants a year that means right off the bat that it's probably not funding just their own denomination or just their own causes. They're probably, in many cases, funding missions or parachurch organizations. But if you go to mainline churches like Anglican or United and Catholic often, um, Lutheran, mainline churches that have a very high social conscious conviction, you might find grants for arts, you might find grants for environment, you might find grants for a wide variety of, of different causes that are outside of religion. You won't probably find that among evangelicals and Pentecostals. Right? Just just yeah. telling you uh, what to do. Faith, sorry. So just to clarify then, 
uh, on the database for grant advance, it's only foundations. It's not government financing or anything like that. No, there's no government funding so in here just, at all. Just no. foundations. No. Yeah, just foundations. And, yeah, exactly. Sorry, Samuel, go ahead. No, that's okay. Um, let's just go back to Diamond quickly. Oh, you're right. Thank you so much. Ah, look at that. You can take over my job. <laughs> Great. So thank Fire. you. Let's get you hired. Yeah, exactly. Um, we'll go back to Diamond. So we just talked about donation history. We looked it up. And really, I saw they gave to art galleries. They gave to theaters. So there was a lot of arts organizations. Uh, they give quite nice, right? 20000 a year is a really nice grant. And they give a lot of ongoing support. Now, if we scroll down, we also have some graphs. Whenever you're doing a national search, so let's say at Toronto Film Festival, this is the first thing that you always look at. Basically, we make sure that they give a lot to our area or a lot over Canada. We need to make sure that they are a national funder. Uh, and in this case, they really favor Vancouver, so that's really nice. The next thing that we can see is what amounts they're most comfortable giving. And especially if it's your first time applying, you don't want to go, let's say, crazy on this. You probably want to stay within the 50% range of where most of their grants are. And in this case, I'd say probably between the five and $25,000. Um, a good strategy to use is if you ask them the first year for a more modest amount, you can oftentimes creep up a little bit more on foundations. It's not such a huge commitment for them the first time, right? The next things that we see are the sectors they give to. So whenever they report to the CRA, every grant has to go into a sector. We have social human services, health, education, religion, and community arts and the environment. So what I see here is uh, any educational programs that you might offer, we're obviously going to want to talk about that. That's a really, really uh, big thing for this foundation. Social human services, I'd say, is, is pretty much all of you, and also the arts. And over here, we see how much each of those categories receive. They've given $30 million to education. That's something we really want to stress on when we reach out to them, right? This is an overview of each of those categories, uh, the total value that each of those categories receive, the largest, the average grant. So really useful. I'll kind of skip over it just for now, though. And the next thing that we see is a rating system. Now, we see that this foundation gives ongoing grants, let's say $20,000 a year. One strategy you might want to use is oftentimes if it's your first time applying, it can be slightly easier to get more of a project specific grant that might have an end date for it. So this year we might want to ask for more of a project specific grant, but next year because we see they give a lot of ongoing funds, let's save it in our system as potential for operating costs of $20,000 and I'd say it was a really relevant contact, let's say it's a four or five star contact. And this is now saved. So next year, when you receive that 20,000 for whatever you asked for this year, if you want to find operating costs, all you have to do is type it into the system, and this foundation is now gonna show up, as well as uh, every other foundation that you said was good for this. If it's a capital grant, maybe they only ever give one-time grants, they never fund the same organization, we would mark it accordingly. So this is really great. We can always use this for the future and save in our system, right? And the very last thing that we have are notes and calendar alerts. Uh, you'll always call the foundation. Any important things, I would record down here. Uh, maybe we called and we talked to John, right? We're gonna say that. And John told us that we should apply in October. Let's give ourselves at least a month to get that letter ready. So on the first week of September, I'm gonna remind myself I have one month to have my letter of inquiry sent off. That can go to your email right here. You'll have your email here, or also your Google Calendar, or both, right? And we can set that notification. If John tells us while we're talking to him that they're really focusing on youth programming, that's something that they've done, um, we're going to talk about youth programming, and we can save this note for us for future use. Okay? Really great. And there's youth programming. Now, let's say we did apply. We applied today, and they got back to us via email. Well, that's great. We're always going to want a record of that. I'm just going to add an attachment right here. I'm going to go to my files, and where's that email John sent me? Ah, here's the response letter. I can upload this, and I'll always have that attachment right there, so I know all communications that I've ever had with John. There, I can click on it and look at it. Yes? 
Um, when you were showing the directors, will it tell you what other nonprofits they're on the boards for? Yes. So any director that has their name underlined means they either serve under another nonprofit or another foundation. And this is great for two reasons. If we click on them and we see that they serve under other nonprofits, maybe you're Jewish. We have something to talk about if we ever reach out to Gordon here. Or if this foundation gives you, let's say, $20,000 this year, uh, Gordon Diamond knows about you. He might have been one of the reasons that you received that grant. Uh, I'm going to look into these other foundations that he serves under. Those are really good leads for me now, right? I already know that uh, Humphrey here knows about me. Let's look into Aspen and Potch here. Click on the Aspen Foundation Center, and it will open up a sub-profile for you to look at to see whether or not you can qualify it right away to decide whether or not it's one that you should apply to. Same address. And you can add it to a favorites list right from there. And nothing wrong with taking the director's name and plugging it, play, plugging it into LinkedIn. Nice. You see corporate affiliations, connections, and potential the deeper dive, as it were. Yeah. 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 Any questions in here? Okay, awesome. So let's exit out of this. Um, and we found this one initially by looking up, uh, I think we did theater and playhouse. Uh, and that might not be useful for some of you. Let's just do one more quickly. We'll do the word um, gallery in BC. And show funders only once. And remember, there's a lot more contacts out there. All of these have given to a gallery before and has to have gallery in their name. So there's a lot of other foundations. Uh, and we have 114 foundations show up. So I would even select these all, and I would drop them into a favorite list, right? This is going to be really useful for future. Gallery Funders BC, uh, in a year or two years from now, if we want to apply to people that give to galleries, those are great contacts. Any questions about that? And, and we're going to talk a little bit more about favorite lists in a couple minutes. It's pretty phenomenal, eh? All this information. It's fun, too. You can kind of play I Spy on Neighbors, right? <laughs> Yeah, so let's open one more, and then I'll kind of go on to the next uh, foundation. So I'll just open this one up here. Uh, Peter and Joanne Brown, they are based in Vancouver. Here's a number. They're very close to us. They give 18 grants a year, about half a million dollars a year. They have 6.6 .6 million sitting in it. And if we come down here, not much is provided. And I would just do a very quick search. Let's do... Uh, or art, or I know we have some music organizations. Um, Right? We'll search that, and what comes up here? Look at all this, right? 24 grants, and it's a very small foundation, so obviously they're really big in the arts. And I see a few of these organizations are here today even. So really, really powerful. Uh, we might want to reach out to this foundation, right? It looks like a great contact for the arts. Um, does this show what fiscal ends are for many of the foundations as well? No. Fiscal year end? Yeah. Um, no, we don't display that at this point. Um, what, I, um, what I can say, it's not really, it's kind of related. Um, and that's a good uh, point, actually. And jot that down, because we could easily do that. Um, the, um, what we do, though, is we up, foundations are required to report for the previous year, year by June 30th. Okay. So we update, uh, we, have, we have typically updated our system uh, four times a year, uh, but we have just made arrangements with the CRA and we'll be updating that monthly. So, and the reason we do that is because lots of foundations are late. <laughs> and um, so uh, we, we have the data, but they may be late, and if they are late for very long, like a year or two, they'll be uh, revoked, and then we remove them from the system. Not really an answer to you question, but, uh, but a good point. We can, we should probably incorporate Yeah, that. just to help the guys. Yeah, yeah it's a great idea. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. If I'm skipping ahead, we can address this later, but I'm wondering, how do you find out uh, whether they actually have application deadlines, whether they take in all year long, whether they have an application okay. form, all of that? Um, that's great. So application deadlines, um, application guidelines. Uh, I will cover a little bit of that later, but not as specifically, but it's a good point. So first of all, um, most foundations don't have a website, as we already, dis as we already uh, discovered. If they don't have a website, they don't have a deadline date. Right? So they, that means that the, you can send out an application to them at any time of the year. A letter of inquiry, we'll talk about that in a moment too. Um, 
the, the letter of inquiry may result in you finding out, oh, you know what, we only accept applications in October. But that's the only way to find out, and you put it in your notes, and then you contact them in October. Set an alert, as Simon just showed you, you could do if you're using a third-party system like this, or in your own internal system, whatever you want to do. Um, so, so the first part of it is most foundations can be applied to any time in the year. And I may as well just say this now. If a foundation does have a website, it doesn't mean they have an online application. Actually, Samuel, open up the Vancouver Foundation. I was going to do it later, but we'll do it right now. Um, if you go to the Vancouver Foundation, uh, most of you are familiar with the Vancouver Foundation. Um, and you'll see that the Vancouver Foundation, in fact, does have a website. And we can click on the link right there, and it'll take us to the Vancouver Foundation website. And you're going to see right away when you click on Grants, um, there are, you apply online. And I'm going to tell you this straight up. When a foundation gives you instructions on how to apply, you follow those instructions to the T. Double spaced, whatever they say. If they ask for a letter of inquiry and they want a preliminary budget, which hardly ever happens, you include a preliminary budget. You do it exactly as they ask or don't bother doing it at all, right? So if they have a website, and in our system, every single page, there's a website icon or there's a website link. Every time you're looking at a foundation, you will know if it has a website. And if they have a website, you absolutely must go to it and follow their instructions explicitly. But even, like I said, most of the found, many of the foundations that have websites still don't have an online application. Exit this, Samuel. Um, and you'll see here there is a ha flag is having an online application. So unflag it and then flag it again. So once we know a foundation has an online application, you can flag it. And once it flags it, our system will deal with it differently, which means it will alert you every time you're dealing with this foundation that you must apply online. Changes color, changes location, and everything. So I'm not trying to pitch, but um, I'm, actually I will. <laughs> um, let, let, me, let me tell you what a third-party resource like this, and we're not the only one, but a third-party resource like this, I have dealt with organizations, I've talked with them on the phone, they've just said, oh, you know what, we, we're going to try this on our own. I said, um, and I called them six months or 12 months later, and guess how far they've gotten? <laughs> they haven't moved at all. And I'm going to tell you, it's like this, you could, if you wanted to hire workers to go out and uh, harvest your wheat field with a scythe. You could do that, or you could uh, get yourself a good John Deere tractor harvester, and your efficiency and your productivity is going to be way, way better. And I'm just telling you that this is already difficult enough. If you are already overworked, you must have a tool, some tool, some tool to make this happen, or it won't happen. Um, you, you're going to, and if you're hiring somebody to do it for you, then for goodness sakes, be kind and give them a tool to do the job you've tasked them to do. And it only makes good sense for you to, too, as far as budget is concerned, because you're probably paying that person by the hour, and they could take 100 hours to do what they would do with a third-party tool in 10, right? So um, these sorts of things are um, this kind of information and these kind of analytics and, uh, and processes, which we'll look at a little bit more later, um, can be really helpful. You've got Another thing I'll just throw in to toot our own horn. Guy mentioned if you hire someone to do this, our system actually tracks and records everything that they do on the system too. So not that you don't trust them, but you can actually specifically <laughs> see how much time they've been putting into it, uh, which would probably be nice for you if you are paying them by the hour, right? So that's kind of nice too, right? And, and then, private, more, more proprietary, and that's for your eyes only. Yeah. Yeah. And where's, where, notes like that, or if you're scanning letters and putting them in the system, where does that reside? Um, we're um, we're cloud-based, uh, but we have the highest le Amazon highest level of security. Your data is completely secure, and, and you only have and, and we even don't have access. We can we cover for you, but we don't um, we don't by virtue of our uh, administrative system have access to your stuff. Awesome. So I'll just go out of here. Um, I don't know exactly where I stopped, but I, I think we were done talking about giving history. Did anybody have questions before I go on to the next search engine?
No? Okay, awesome. So let's go to by foundation name. Um, and this is a great one. We can do several things here. We can type in Vancouver. And I'll do Vancouver. We'll do four or more grants a year. Um, did you know that there's 250 foundations in Vancouver that give over four or more grants a year? These are interesting, right? You might even be able to have coffee with some of these individuals. A lot of our organizations have done that. And let's take out Vancouver and what Guy was saying earlier, family foundations are very powerful to look into. Um, we can even take this off for the family foundations in this case. And there's 103 family foundations in British Columbia. One of them on this first page has a website. Uh, people have no idea that these exist. Often they can do whatever they'd like as long as you spark an interest. Uh, and oftentimes people aren't applying to them. As you can see, you probably had no idea this first page existed. And so, yeah. So no, I'm, just, I'm just watching the clock a little bit here. Yeah. So um, what I'm going to ask you to do is to take these, select them, save them to the favorites list for family. It'll be enough for us to demonstrate further. And we may come back to this. I know there are a few different searches that we're going to do. But I think, we, I think we'll go on with some more, um, some different material. I think that you've got the idea and what can be done. And, and, and the rest of the search engines, it's just a matter of learning how to use them. So um, let me just get to where we want to be here. So as you probably noticed, when we were putting those into favorite lists, some of you who are a little bit savvy or you've been in, around the block here a couple of times, you're going, that foundation's no good for me. Uh, Samuel's put it, he's added to a favorite list. Like, that, that foundation's never going to find me. Well, you've created the favorite list right now, but you haven't qualified them. And that's something that you're going to do. So we, we suggest this as a strategy. Again, whether you use a third party or whether you use um, your own internal system, uh, we think the most efficient way is to gather, gather as many foundations as you possibly can that might possibly fund you, put them in a list, and then we want to qualify them. Everybody that's in those favorite lists that Samuel just saved, they're there for a reason. They're there because they met a certain set of criteria that you put in. But that doesn't mean that they're going to fund you. So now what we need to do is we need to remove them, or in our system we would block them, so they would never come back in a future search unless you restored it. But what you want to do is you want to remove irrelevant foundations. So here are the ways that you would identify, put your whole big list together, and now we're going to go through them each one by one. That may sound tedious, but, but really realize that you only have to do it once, and you really will only take a couple or three minutes of reviewing a foundation in order to determine whether or not you want to remove it from your list. And the things you're going to look for are these. The first of all, you're going to look, are they designated giving or donor advised? Do, do you know what that is? No. Okay, there's organizations like CHIMP or Canada Helps or um, most um, organizations with the word employee in it, employee trust, employees trust. Those organizations are conduits. So in the case of CHIMP, um, you might say, hey, I want to give $50,000 to XYZ Charity. You give that money to CHIMP, CHIMP gives that to XYZ Charity. You would never apply to them for funding, and they will never award anybody a grant. So you want to remove, and that will normally be found under um, their ongoing programs. It will say, uh, which one is this, Senna? Canada Helps. Canada Helps. So it says right there, um, it's something about donor advised. You're looking for donor advised or designated giving. And generally, there are some exceptions, but generally you just want to remove them immediately from your list. So the first thing you look for, are they designated giving? Get rid of them. So it takes no time to find that out. Most of them will have a website, and you'd look at it and say, oh, okay, eliminate that one. The second thing that you want to do is you're going to want to re remove ones that are regionally restrictive. That would be, for example, um, I'm sure that if we did an art search in BC, uh, we would get the Abbotsford Community Foundation. And if you're living in Prince George, you may as well block it without even looking at it. The chances are that they fund outside of Abbotsford, maybe a little bit in the Fraser Valley. And if they did fund in Prince George, I can tell you why. Somebody that knows somebody in Abbotsford moved there. <laughs> right? That's the only reason Prince George got that funding, just get rid of them. However, I want to warn you, do not uh, be aggressive. At community foundations almost certainly you're going to get rid of unless they're really in your area. 
But if you see a foundation and go, oh, they only fund Vancouver. Oh, I hear so much whining about, they only fund Vancouver. Let's get used to it. Most of the grants in Canada are going where? Toronto, Winnipeg, Calgary, Vancouver. Why? Because that's where most of the people are. That's where most of the charities are. So what you want to do is you want to look at the donation history, open up any profile, uh, Vancouver, um, yeah, Vancouver Foundation would be good. But it doesn't matter, you'll, you'll get what I'm saying. If you look at the donation history, it says Vancouver, 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 Kamloops. Vancouver, 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 for another two pages, Prince George. Vancouver, 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 you get what I'm saying? If they show that they are not, by their own mandate, restricted to literally Vancouver or whatever the one area is, then you can certainly keep them in, and you should. Because you want to cast your net as wide as you possibly can. And then this, the third reason you would get rid of them is if they're single purpose foundations. So you just look at the donation history, and if you saw the Justice Institute of BC, and the only recipient was the Justice Institute of BC, then they're a single purpose foundation and you just get rid of them. They, they were created. It, those are, that's really typical of hospital foundations. So applying for foundations, let's just talk about the really important part here, and that is about building relationship. Um, Sam, you have a few things in there. Do you want to just export a list to Excel? Yeah. <laughs> so here, here we're going to talk about, there's one thing about just going through and sending out letters and doing whatever you want to do and just, you know, I'm just getting it out of my hair. But you really need to also always remember that building relationship is what this is all about. And that's where you want to go and that's what you want to do and put effort into it. So uh, whether you're making first contact by phone, if they have a phone, or email if they have a phone email, or a letter of inquiry, if that's what you have to do, you really want to make sure that you get personal as, as, as much as you can. Um, so what I mean by that, if the person has a contact information, and they give a contact person, and they give a phone number, pick up the phone. Talk to them. These aren't scary people. Um, you might find out that in that initial discussion that mm, they're never going to fund you, but that's good. You found out right away. You didn't have to waste any more time. Um, you're going to um, prepare before you make the call. Review the report page if you have one. Uh, review their website if they have one. Uh, do a little bit of Google search, news, search for directors, search for LinkedIn. Do a little bit of research and then contact them directly. Uh, you know, Verify their contact information, but really what you're doing is you're saying, who are you? What are you all about? Are there any new initiatives? What are your directives? What's important for you this year? Have things shifted? Are they going to shift? Um, try to search this out and have your elevator speech ready and be ready to be passionate. Exude passion and build and try to forge a relationship uh, with these organizations when that opportunity is available. Um, and just remember this, uh, David alluded to it earlier. Foundations were created to give money away. We all hate asking for money. We're afraid to ask for money. Anybody? I really hate asking for money. But not with foundations. Foundations were created with one purpose, and that is to give money away. And if it's not you, then who? Right? So be bold. And they're, they're generally nice, approachable, friendly, helpful philanthropists. So uh, you might end up with the odd crank. Who, who knows? Who cares? Um, you just get out there, you put a smile on your face, and you do your very best to really, if possible, forge a friendship. And that is another thing that I want to say. I, I, I've dealt with organizations that make this mistake. They have and should have uh, many people in their organization that might be doing all the documentation and all the rest of it. And if they've done all the work, and don't worry about their feelings. The person that makes the contact and the person that signs that document needs to be senior representation in your organization. It needs to be the executive director or the founder or the chair or the president. It doesn't need to be anybody else. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. you, you're dealing with the top there or hopefully going to get to the top and they need to be dealing with the top with you as well. Okay? So, um, and then research, I've already mentioned it, we've already been doing it. Um, I'm going to date myself here. Um, how many of you remember, there's this song about a frog that wanted to marry, I think, a cat of all things. Remember that song? 
A frog of wood, a woo, we go, hey ho, hey ho, right? <laughs> well, what I just found out, and I have a bit of a bone to pick with the opera people here, <laughs> because the second stanza of that song is, so off he set with his opera hat, hey ho. Now, I, I don't even know what an opera hat is, and I sure didn't know that it was going to give me a sexy edge when I was going to go out and try and court somebody. But the point of this is, is that don't be afraid to court and do whatever it takes. Put on your opera hat. Whatever it is, what do you have in your arsenal that you can do to build these relationships? Your arts organizations, for crying out loud, you have events, right? Invite them to your events. Give them free tickets. If they're in your neighborhood, or more importantly, you're in theirs, take them out for lunch, right? See if they're available. Try to forge and build relationships with any of the decision makers that you possibly can. Um, understand your funding partner. Um, if you have a previous relationship with the foundation, then that's clear. You use that to decide it. But if you are trying to build a new relationship, and this may in some ways be the most important thing I have to say today. You're, you're trying to find organizations to fund you. They don't know you. You don't know them. You're doing a brand new relationship. Let me ask you this. If you go out on a first date and the guy asks you to marry him, I mean, really, would you? And that is exactly the same thing that we have here. If you're making contact for the first time with a new foundation, really, your best chance of getting approval is if your project has a clear end date. Right? You want to apply for a project-based funding opportunity. That way, they get to know you with very little risk in case it doesn't go well. And you get an opportunity to do your very best to make sure it goes well to ensure future and larger funding. Does that make sense? Yeah. Don't be afraid of asking if, don't be afraid of asking for 2,000, 3,000, 5,000, 7,000. These are getting your foot in the door, right? These are, and these are helpful grants, right? And if it's a larger project, then ask for multiple modest grants from many foundations, right? But definitely give them, give them an opportunity um, to come on board with you on a project-based um, basis. Um, get known. Um, get used to this. The majority of letters of inquiry are rejected. Did you know that? If you send out 100 or 200 letters of inquiry, which I think is a reasonable number to send out, um, there's some controversy over this, even among fund development professionals. Um, some say letters of inquiry are a waste of time. I don't believe that at all. Um, and if you don't have a relationship with the foundation, and um, I'm just going to ask you, if not sending a letter of inquiry, do you have a better plan? Do you, do you have a better plan, really? Um, so we really advocate this, send out as many letters of inquiry as you can to absolutely everybody that might fund you. And the reason I'm saying this, that this is a very low cost, high impact activity that puts your organization in touch with some of the most significant philanthropic individuals and organizations in Canada. Right? It's worth a stamp. Get your name out there, and there's gravitas that comes with associations. We're going to talk a little bit about persistence, but I'm, I'm going to say the more foundations that fund you, the more foundations that will fund you. They, it gives you credibility. Um, keep your ask under 25,000 in general. Here, here's some other stats. Um, the largest amount of money given in any given year in Canada are grants over 100,000. But the largest number of grants are under 25,000. About 80% of all grants are under 25,000. So keeping that in mind, you're going to increase your likelihood if you make multiple modest requests, especially in establishing your relationship in the first place. And then if you do have the resource, use third party um, analytics to find out what the average grant amount is. For example, some foundations, quite a lot actually, have never given a grant more than 3,000. 
Well, your chance of getting 10,000 is almost zero, especially if they don't know you. And if, the, if that's the case, then ask them to start participating with you. And it could become an annual thing. And, you know, forge that friendship and relationship. But ask for an amount that they have been historically comfortable with, and you are much more likely to get funded. Now, they're not all 3,000. There's a lot in the 10 to 25,000. There's a lot that are well over that. But understand the landscape and the reality of the foundation world in Canada. And, and ask accordingly. Uh, it'll definitely um, bring things uh, way up for you. Um, I, we are running, um, running shy of time here. I'm not sh quite sure if we're going to go through the document generator, but you can bring it up, Samuel. Um, uh, the, um, we skipped the spreadsheet. It just, it's just information. It gives you the contact person, the phone number, and just use that kind of information. Um, the, we, we get to the part of how do you make the initial contact. Well, in the majority of cases in Canada, you are not going to have a website. Worse yet, you're not going to have an email. Worse yet, you're not going to have a contact person. Um, and the only thing you're going to have is a address. That's what it is. So you're limited to sending out a letter of inquiry and hoping that they respond to you. And once they respond to you, sending out a proposal. How many of you have never drafted a letter of inquiry or a proposal? Any of you? OK. So don't be worried about that. Um, there, there are, uh, there's great information online. A letter of inquiry is so simple. It's a two-page letter. Never let it be more than that. It's just saying who you are, what you're doing, and asking for permission to submit a proposal. And if you don't have a relationship or permission, never write and send a full proposal first. It's, it's, it's bad etiquette, actually. It'll probably get thrown out. But that's good news for you, because for every project, all you have to do is write a two-page letter and send it out to 100 or 200 people, right? And that letter, um, the, with the $5 billion industry, you better believe that foundations have certain standards and protocols. They expect every document to follow a, generally the same procedure they want an executive summary, they want an introduction, they want funding, um, they want sustainability. There's, there's a number of different things, components that they expect and want. Well, we use that commonality to help you create essentially a master document for your letter of inquiry or your proposal because the information you're going to send is always the same. If you're sending it to one person or 200 people, basically the information with that project is the same. And so we help you to create a master document, let's say a letter of inquiry, and from there you can customize. Samuel, I don't even know that we're going to have time to go through it, um, or, um, but for example, um, what we've done here, just click on the cover letter. Um, this is going to give instructions, paragraph by paragraph, and links, and you just type it in here and there's other things, but you would basically be, compose your master document for your project. Just create one real quick and then we'll go to the customization period. Um, you create a master document that has all of the content and all of the stuff and all the information that is necessary. Create a master document and once it's created, go ahead. Once it's created, if you go up to the top list there, and again, you can do this internally as well, master document, just click on the master document. All of the funders that we identified and added to this project are already in here, and this master document has been applied to every single one of them. So when Samuel hits next funder, what it's going to do is customize your document. It's going to put your letterhead in. It's going to put in the date of printing. It's put in the address. And we're going to be able to come in here, and we're going to be able to change the director to the one that is the most appropriate. So um, it might be Stephen, uh, or in this case, we'd probably do the Latner family, because it's two Latners. And we change the grant amount that we're asking for to an average. Now, we won't go to it. You go to the funder report page and determine whether it's 38000 or 5000 But because it's a first contact, we're going to make it 5000 And then you hit next funder. And the next organization is brought up, and you do the same thing. You would go um, and you would take a look at the um, individuals that are uh, serving on the board, and you would change the amount, and you would um, customize it. You would also maybe go to the profile page to find out if they give to arts 30%, but they give to social and human services 50%. 
you might want to include a paragraph in there about how that foundation, um, how your grant includes um, uh, your arts program serves youth at risk. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. So now you, are, now, you are, now you are matching yourself to them based on the information that you have on an organization. Um, we're, that's a, I think all the time that we'll have for that, Samuel. Um, for any of you who have writer's block, um, that really is a fantastic tool because it will tell you literally what you need to be putting in there. This is not a template. Um, this is, you're, you're creating a template in a sense, but for each individual project and in your own words. So every time you have a new project, you're creating a new document, you're writing it yourself, you're taking the commonality, putting it in there, and then you are customizing. And whether, again, you use a third party, you can do this internally, um, and I would really highly recommend it. Um, don't write uh, it out a hundred different times. Just um, follow it along that way. Um, and then just follow up. Um, as far as follow up is concerned, let's see, you know, it's just common sense. If an um, organization declines your request and they send you a letter saying, sorry, for whatever reason, Send them a thank you letter. For goodness sakes, they've taken the time to read your request and to respond to you. Do not neglect to immediately send them a thank you letter. If they approve you, of course, immediately send them. You'll be in touch with them as well. But you know, ask them, how, what, how do you want us to report? Ask them if they're OK with you acknowledging them. Like, do you, is it okay if we put you in your, our newsletter or in our website? And think, because some foundations don't want to be not acknowledged. They don't want public, um, they don't want to be seen. They don't want other people calling them. <laughs> right? So get permission on that. And then here's one you'll have to think about. But if they don't respond to you at all, and please get ready for this reality as well. If you send out 100 or 200 letters of inquiry, most of those organizations will not respond to you at all. The next largest group will be one saying no. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're hoping to pick up a few that you have, but, but think about, even if you get three or four, the goal that is there, those are possibly long-term, lifetime relationships that can go on to uh, additional relationships as you move forward. Um, but if you get no response, up to you, but we would recommend 30 or 60 days later, a follow-up letter just simply thanking them for not uh, soliciting them, you know, you, know, and that's a, you know, maybe acknowledging that you sent a letter, but, but patting them on the back for what they do. To see if you can find out any information about them, but basically because, again, this is about you getting your name out there, them remembering you. And Samuel, I think you told us about an organization, or this last week, an organization that sent out an LOI to a bunch of organizations last year. Yeah, they didn't get any responses, so they uh, sent the exact same letters of inquiry to 30 organizations that didn't respond, and they got 10,000. So they just reprinted off the documents, the new date was put on, and they got 10,000. <laughs> right? So here's also our recommendation to you is if, um, and this, this goes into, um, and this will be pretty much finishing up with this, um, persistence. Charities that develop a consistent strategy and a persistent strategy for applying to foundations, they do see in almost every case a sustainable and substantial funding stream come to their organization. But it's not, uh, it, this is not magic and it's not luck. It is long-term execution to achieve this level of success. This year you hope that you'll get some grants. Next year you hope you'll get more. And as you continue on, you will build, as I was saying, if the more foundations that fund you, the more that other foundations will look at you. One of my favorite quotes from uh, A Man From All Seasons is, I wish we could all have good luck all the time. I wish rainwater was beer, <laughs> but it ain't. And I wish I could tell you that this was magic and you could push a button and it would all happen, but it won't, right? 
you absolutely are going to have to be strategic about it and you're going to have to go into it for the long haul with absolutely phenomenal potential and results. In fact, we haven't done it, but if we start to go in and do comparisons in cost analysis, return on investment and risk for all of the various fundraising activities that you could be involved in, foundation funding has to rise right to the top in terms of the amount of time and the amount of money that you have to invest, right? So uh, we really encourage you to go that way. And one of the uh, things, we, as far as that strategy is concerned, we recommend as the three best funding cycles, the beginning of the first, second, and fourth quarter of the year. So generally we would say that you should send out applications around September, October. Um, if a foundation is at their fiscal year end, <laughs> back to that question, um, then they have money they have to get rid of, three and a half percent. So they're emptying their coffers, um, besides the fact that September is the new beginning. January is a new beginning, and of course if it's a fiscal new beginning, their coffers are full, right? They're most active and they have money, they have money available. And then the only reason we say May, um, uh, April, May area is because this is the period of time just before foundations tend to wind down over the summer and directors are off on holidays. We would recommend the summer really for your research and your preparation and try to schedule three campaigns a year. And once you've done your first one, the second one will be much easier and the third one will be a piece of cake. Really, it will be. So uh, that's what we mentioned. And then um, just in terms of uh, passion, let, just don't be mistaken about this. You are competing with other organizations for this money. And probably with other organizations with a very similar mandate, right? So you need to honk your horn. <laughs> don't be afraid of promoting yourself and being prepared to do that. Um, one of the things that is also quite often helpful is if you can back up the passion you have and the enthusiasm you have for your organization by some really great um, statistical information like how involved are your directors, how involved are your board members, including how involved are they financially, um, how many volunteers do you have, how many people in the community are engaged, have you won any community awards, prove to them that you guys are known and, and really making a difference. Testimonials, stories, oh my goodness, stories, stories, stories sell. Stories and pictures, right, of uh, the things that we're doing. And then uh, finally, I've alluded to it a few times, and, that, and this is the end, um, patience, or how to convert declined and no responses into funding opportunities. So when you get an uh, organization decline you, or when they don't respond to you, then uh, this is not a lost opportunity. This is the beginning of an opportunity. This is your opportunity to stand out in a way that all of your peers do not. Right? This is, this is your ability, like I said, sending that letter when they don't even respond. Ways to, ways to make yourself um, stand out. Um, keep in contact and maintain contact. If you have an organization on your list and you sent out a letter of inquiry and another letter of inquiry and another one and they haven't responded, we would say the only time you take a foundation off of your list, if you vetted it and qualified it, right? You know that there's potential. The only time you should do that is if they specifically ask you to stop contacting them, right? Or if you get a letter from them declining your request that makes it so brutally clear that their vision and your vision will never match, then you take them off. Otherwise, I would say don't take them off unless you have sent them a letter of inquiry at least a half a dozen times every six to 18 months, somewhere, whatever, you, whatever you're doing, just keep sending your letter, because as Samuel said, sent out a letter of inquiry, and the next year sent out exactly the same one, and, and had no response, and then actually received money. And, and foundation sentiments will change with the times. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you remember the aspect of mental health being veritably in the closet five years ago, look how it's burgeoning. Yes. The arts sector now, uh, if it's healing factor, there are things you need to you keep your fingers on the pulse and it's certainly sentiment and public sentiment tends to change foundation giving interests as well. It's very interesting. And what Dave is talking about changes that we've also noticed um, and we believe it's a change in the industry and others here with more experience could um, let us know if we're, if we're right on this but a grant award typically takes about four to 12 months, right? From the time it starts to the time it ends. We are finding 
that a very well-crafted letter of inquiry is resulting in much quicker results. In fact, actually, yeah, let me cut in here. This is a letter, so when an organization is successful, we oftentimes ask them for their letter of inquiry, so we can use it as an example. This was an organization that created this letter of inquiry in our document generators, and just from this letter of inquiry, they applied to 107 foundations, they got 50,000, and they were also requested three proposals. So proposals are really, really strong needs. The foundation's asking for more information. They don't want that if they're not interested. So they probably got more, but just from the letter of inquiry they sent out from 100 foundations, uh, they got 50,000. And we're seeing that more and more all the time. And that's partly foundations streamlining their process, um, and it's partly uh, a well-crafted letter. But you can start, especially if it's a modest amount, don't expect that for a multi-million dollar uh, capital campaign, but if it's a modest amount, um, they, a lot of these organizations have the ability, in fact, it could be just one guy that writes the check. And if you get on his right side, it's in the mail. So um, just to close this all off, you know what, uh, grant writing, uh, fundraising is both a science and an art. We hope we've provided you with a little bit of the science today and uh, you guys can bring the art to it. So, uh, does anybody have any questions? Actually, I just had a question about, there were the rates published about what, for the service you provide? Oh, um, yes, and actually, um, so with Brenda, um, there was a, uh, you're talking about yeah. subscribing to a membership? Yes. Um, you know what, I'm, I, I don't deal with this that oh, much okay. myself. <laughs> so, um, um, but what I do know is that depending on the number of organizations, if you're a part of the Arts Alliance, I believe that, we, that Brenda negotiated up to a 40% discount. Yeah, okay. if people are interested, um, hi, I'm Joyce, I'm the admin assistant for the Alliance for Arts and Culture. And so if you are a member of the BC Alliance for Arts and Culture, we've been offered a collective discount on grant events, and that's going to pe depend on how many members sign up for the program. So it's up to, um, if. 20 or more members sign up, then we're going to get 45% off the monthly fee, as well as $300 off um, one-time license fee. And if there are less members that sign up, there's still going to be a discount, <coughs> and it just lowers as we go. Um, so right now, we're collecting expressions of interest in signing up for the program. So if you are interested, please shoot me an email at joyce at allianceforarts.com. And I have cards at the front desk where you came in, so I can give those to you if you need my contact information. And we will figure out how much of a discount will be offered. Oh, great. Just to have an idea, what is the monthly the fee? fee and what is the yeah. signing fee? Our professional membership, it, we have a one-time registration fee of $795. So that gives you um, guaranteed renewal rates. It gives you um, um, unlimited support. Um, and um, it um, and, and our initial one-on-one -on -one training session. Um, so and some and some other features um, that are in like in our our professional version. So it's seven hundred and ninety-five dollars for for just normal off the street. Seven hundred and ninety-five dollars to register, and then seventy-nine dollars a month to maintain your membership. Um, that seven ninety-five is never paid again. So the seventy-nine times twelve, so eight times so. Eight, just around a thousand dollars, just under a thousand dollars a year um, for a membership. However, um, with the alliance, um, it, the seven ninety five is down to um, four ninety five. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's so if yeah. if they have the maximum discount, it would be um, four ninety five to register, and then it would be um, forty five percent. Forty five percent, about half, almost half of the um, seventy nine. So around eighty, uh, around forty two or three a month. So you're, and then you're, um, so you'd have an initial registration of 395, but after that, your annual fee would be um, under 500, I think, a year. So something like that. What about the prize winners? The prize winners don't pay anything. Forever? Uh, forever. Well, no, they get the first year. <laughs> they, get a four, they get the first year. Come on. That's still a good deal, right? Yeah. So you, you get your first year membership. Um, and then, uh, and then if you found, had found it useful, and uh, you would have, you would get the discount, and you wouldn't be paying the registration fee; you'd just be paying the monthly. You just, you just go on to monthly after that. So, 
It's been a real honor for us to be here. Um, we always are grateful for people to give us their time and attention. Uh, we hope we've provided you with some good information. But again, uh, we wish you, all of you, um, all the very best with the work that you're doing. And um, appreciate, uh, appreciate the difference you make in our province. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.